Welcome to the Ken Rampersad Show here in New York and on Island Zone Radio. My name is Ken Rampersad. Um, so welcome again to this show. I have three very two special guests with me in studio today. Um, you'll be very surprised. They are no stranger to me. Um, Sadi, to uh, my right, um, has been a friend for a long time. Actually, Sadi is all the way from Guyana. And I'm so glad that we are teaming up to bring this topic, alcoholism, um, to discuss today. You know, s many years ago, I, when I was working at the detox center, I met Sadi. Um, in fact, he came today to my door, to the door at the nurse's station, and he said he wanted to make some donation to um, where I was working. I said, wait, where are you from? Are you from Guyana? And he said, yes, I'm from Guyana. So um, I said, which part? He said, Lenora. And you know, I am from Lenora. So I said, wait, don't tell me who you are. I think I know you. And then I said, Sadi, and yes, we live in the same spot. I used to play card with his grandfather in Guyana. And so Sadi has been in this community doing a lot of work for our Indian population, our Guyanese population too, and people from all across the United States. So I'm so glad, Sadi, welcome aboard thank tonight. You, you. To my extreme right is my friend. I call him a friend because he is a true friend to me, John Douglas. John has been my friend for a couple of years, and he is uh, with addiction, working with a lot of clients from all over the world. He has um, 13 years of experience working with people who do drugs, alcohol, um, crack cocaine, marijuana, all sorts of things. And he has been a great counselor. He even talks to me. And why I say he's my friend, you know, sometimes when I have to go drive my bird through across the United States, I would want somebody to take me to the airport or I'll take a taxi. And because we live in such a, I work in such a close proximity to the airport, he would always take me to the airport. So, John, welcome to the Ken Rampersad Show. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, while we do that, I want to say, um, you guys, if you can please share our program and like our program, we would like to say, um, I see Rajiv Nandalan locked in. Um, Jameer, all the way from Canada, Jameer Mohammed. Daisy, a pleasant good afternoon to you too. Um, Varshini is on. Sonia Debedin, it's good to see you locked on. Thank you so much. Um, to Gita Baldeo, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, let's see. And your cousin is on, Raymond um, Hamid, all the way from Virginia. You want to say hello to him, Sadi? Yeah, hey, Carlos, how you doing? <laughs> it's good to have you on. I see my good friend, a board man. Luis Cordero is on, my good friend. Vina Turner, um, another advocate for um, the homeless population, and she does so much work for people who who um, doing drugs and so on. So it's good to see you. To my friend Apache Warrior, thank you so much for your support, first of all, and thank you for tuning in our show. Aditya, thank you for tuning in. Um, Nicole Ray, thank you for tuning in. Hasino Banu, that's you should know Hasino Banu. Yes, She's all the way from Lenora, but living in Canada. To my very good friend, Miss Priya Prasad. Hello, my dear, and thank you for your support. Russell Link, thank you so much for um, tuning in um, onto the program. So, you know, today let's talk about um, alcoholism a little bit. I'm going to give you guys a little um, statistics about alcoholism, too. Alcoholism is one of the biggest public health crises in the United States today, and it has been for generations, as you guys know. We know this because of statistics and information on alcoholism and addiction and have collected over the years showing how alcohol and substance abuse have affected people across gender, age, and socioeconomic status. Through this, we know uh, the best source for treatment, meaning that despite the scope of alcoholism, getting evidence-based help for the problem is always possible. Um, according to the Mayo Clinic, uh, they explain that alcoholism is a physical and emotional dependency on alcohol. Someone who is an average alcoholic cannot control their constant impulse and drinking, even as the drunkenness causes relationship problems, job, school problems, financial problems, and health problems. And according to the Center for Disease Control, six people die every day from alcohol poisoning. The effect of drinking too much alcohol too quickly, about 76% of the people who die are men. There are 100,000 who die every year as a result of drinking and driving and other accidents like falls, fire, suicide, and homicide related to alcohol consumption. Alcoholism 
is the third leading lifestyle-related cause of death in the United States, coming from tobacco, an unhealthy diet, and or lack of exercise. A person who succumbs to ex excessive alcohol use loses a potential of 30 years of potential life and as many as 40% of all hospital beds across the country are used to treat health conditions that develop from alcoholism. The epidemic is such that many, a 17% of men in the general population and 8% of women will meet the criteria for alcoholism in their lifetime. So we're gonna come with the music and as soon as we come music, um, Saudi and John, we are gonna talk about this and give you guys a little more insight of this alcoholism and how we can really help um, people who um, has been diagnosed with um, alcoholism. So let's go with some music. And you're listening to the Ken Rampersad Show. Ch the far east ball from UK.
ch safari fall from uk Guys, welcome to the Ken Rampersad show here in New York and on Island Zone Radio. So, so Saudi or John, which one of you comfortable answering the question? So we learned that people with alcohol problem um, doesn't have to be one sex. Uh, yeah, I mean alcoholism, um, as we discussed before, you know, the other right. time I was here, um, it's a non-discriminatory disease. Um, much like cancer, right? Yeah, you don't know who's going to get it, whatever the case may be. So alcoholism is a disease. It affects everyone across the board the same, uh, pretty much the same way. It doesn't matter, you know, what gender you are. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, what race you are, whatever the case may be, um, because it's a disease and the disease of the mind and body. So it doesn't discriminate anything in, with reference to, you know, what gender you are or anything like that. And John, if you could say, uh, in terms of um, so socioeconomic status, you could be rich or poor. Or, or yes, it doesn't really have any boundaries when you talk about uh, whether a person is rich or poor. Um, alcoholism doesn't know anything about your your situation, whether or not you are working on a high level a high level job or whether you're at a low level job. It doesn't it doesn't discriminate like you just said. So. Right, even you're rich or poor, we all um, can become an alcoholic. Yes, and um, and if you're rich, it can make you poor because you're gonna be so much drinking yeah. that you're gonna lose all your money. Uh, and you know that's another thing as well, right? Sure, uh, and if you're poor, you can become poor. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It, you know, and and that's the the, the, the thing about al alcohol. Um, it could make you um, cause a lot of problems, and we know that. Um, let's talk about relationship. Mm -hmm. How can it um, affect relationship? I'll let you, both of you guys um, give your input with, with your knowledge. Uh, what do you think, John? Uh, and then you can come, yeah. Saudi. Yeah, well, you know, alcoholism destroys families. Um, it just doesn't separate the two individuals. It actually destroys the whole family. Um, when you look at it, a lot of dysfunction comes through alcoholism. So family dysfunction it plays a major role and, and um, family dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So, and also domestic violence, and we can trickle on down. Yeah, we and will all talk about all right, of that, yes. And all of these things start happening because uh, alcoholism becomes a denial for one. Uh, a person can say, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not addicted to alcohol. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with alcohol. Um, and that seems to be the one substance that many people deny being addicted to. I, I saw a while I was reading up today, and I, I know that, that a lot of people are in denial for alcohol. And why you think so? I'm sorry. Why you think people in denial for alcohol? Well, I mean, going back to the original thing, you know, it destroying a family. You know, one mm -hmm. of the thing is, you know, uh, drinking ends all dreams. You know, dead. Um, yeah. Essentially, um, you know, and going back to the previous question, you know, uh, you don't have a high paying job because you mm -hmm. never was able to finish school. You were never able. Yeah to focus on anything um, productive. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of um, coming back to how it affects the family and so on, uh, you know, alcohol, it's an addiction, meaning that it takes over everything that you think about. And people deny it because socially it's acceptable. Exactly. Back home, you know, it's guys, they work, they can feel five days, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to go out and have a good time, right? That, that's the whole thing. And um, because it's socially uh, acceptable and because uh, people see it as a social lubricant, you know, yeah. you go to a business event, well, you're supposed to have drinks there, they're supposed to have this there. And, um, and that, that is the thing. So for it, it's easy. Most of the time, guys would say, well, no, I, I'm okay. I only do it once in a while, but that's not the truth. 
you know. And the, by the time the truth gets around, mm -hmm. the family split apart. He mm -hmm. lost his job, and then he's like, "Well, you know, I really should have said the right thing." But you know, that's mm -hmm. that's how it, it it slowly erodes the fabric of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's true. And then we learned that um, six people die every day from alcohol poisoning, mm -hmm. and the effect of drinking too much alcohol um, too quickly. And and that's when we talk about binge binge drinking, you know what I'm saying? So John, you can probably talk a little bit about binge drinking. Yeah, well binge drinking is more defined by people that feel that they're functional. Mm -hmm. Right? So then they treat themselves, right? And they'll go on a binge, which is a mini run, um, and they'll start drinking excessively because maybe they just got a tax return or maybe they got a bonus on a job, a raise, or whatever might have happened. But majority of these people are pretty functional. So they think that they can control their little mini run. And it doesn't work out that way. The next thing they know, they're 24 hours and they're 48 hours in. And it continues and they can't stop. And why, Saudi, why do you think people drink? And I, I, had, I was asking my question, myself this question, why do people drink? So let me see what you're going to tell me. Oh, man, um, <coughs> that is a, such a subjective uh, question because everybody you ask, they're going to tell you a different reason, right? Yes, yes. Um, so uh, based on how many alcoholics <coughs> you are, that, that's how many excuses you're going to get. Well, you know, I lost my job. Oh, you know, I got a job. Oh, my wife left me. Oh, I got married. You know, so there are so many reasons that a guy would come up with. Um, I'm, and I'm not talking about a guy who has a drink once in a while, once every three months, or he has two drinks and he says, listen, I got a headache, I got to go home. I'm talking about a guy that John just referenced, the bin drinker, right? He, he would go out for days. And then uh, before you know it, you know, he comes home, he doesn't have any money, he can't pay for anything. Mm -hmm. So those guys, if you ask them every time, they will give you a different answer. I know what the truth is. No one knows. Mm -hmm. that. That's why it's a mental disease because there's no real answer for that. A guy would come up with whatever reason to justify it yep. and deny and, uh, and doesn't want to accept the fact that, oh, you know what? Maybe I have a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the problem. The, pro the chronic alcoholic or the person who does this all the time, the last thing he wants to do is say, you know, I got a problem because you know what happens next? That means you got to do something about it. Right. You know? And then the shame, the shame that comes with it too. People mm -hmm. don't want to say, well, you know what, I have a problem drinking, and, and that's a, it's a bad thing. And I think that we learned that seventy-six percent of the people who um, die with alcohol problems are men. And why are so many men drinking? Are, uh, can we deal with a problem like ladies are mm -hmm. dealing with? Um, how they are dealing with their problems? What do you think? Well, I, you know what I think. Um, this, I just want to piggyback on right, what you right. just Go said. Right ahead. Um, when you look at it. If you hear the conversation between two people sitting at a bar, one person may, may be thinking, why do you drink too, so little? And the other one may be saying, why do you drink so much? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that doesn't really make for a, a real conversation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because the, the person that's drinking too much will find somebody that's drinking as much as he is. Right. He right. or she is, right? Yes. And, and it's like the, the pity party thing happens, and then I'm able to share why I'm drinking so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because... I'm paying all of this, I'm doing all of that, I got all of these pressures, this and that, she's on my back, he's on my back, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. It's spilled all out everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that just gives them more leadway to continue to drink. So they'll drink excessively. And no one's going to stop them because that person's next to them doesn't have a stop on them. And they keep going together, drinking and drinking and drinking, and it keeps going. That's, that's true. And, and, and it's, that's why, um, Saudi, in fact, you know, I, I was just thinking the amount of years that you guys are listening to here with, with the three of us. We have 40, 49 years of experience mm -hmm. dealing with people who are doing drugs and alcohol and so on. So um, when we come back, we're going to listen to some music because I want to, for you guys to listen to some music. And we will talk a little more about alcoholism. But I want to say hello to some people here on online. Um, I see Gern Passad. Thank you for tuning in. Um, it's always a pleasure having you online. So much comments coming in. Maria Harris um, says that 
uh, let me see, Mario says, I don't think alcohol is the answer or solution to problems because at the end of the day, the problems are still there. And you are correct, Mario. The problem is still there. And um, no matter how much alcohol you drink, and I've always heard that, that when you wake up, and I'm, my patients always say, man, when we wake up, is the same problem there. So I've always asked them, why do you drink? John Dema, thank you very much for watching. He's from Suriname. I got my cousin, Prem Chan David Budram, all the way from Hartford City, Connecticut. Who else I have? Um, yeah, Priya is there. Uh, the addiction starts at one small step. That's right. You are correct. Um, let's see who else we have. I don't want to miss any one of you guys' name. Also, um, I want to say thank you very much for um, tuning into this program, and I thank you for tuning in last week. And thanks for your a lot of support that you guys given me. Um, and so much of you guys wrote last week. So I am very grateful for all of you because, you know, this is only my second episode. I see Anne Rosemary Baldio. Um, thank you for tuning in. That's another cousin of mine. I'm so glad that you guys are tuning in here um, tonight. So let's go um, and uh, we're going to... Oh, Maureen Ramcharan. Thank you very much for tuning in, Maureen. So just guys, bear with me. I'm looking to see who names I can see. Um, there's a lot of comments coming in. So don't forget, um, my friends, please um, share the page and let's hear a nice song. You are listening to the Ken Rappersod Show. Thank you, Neela, for tuning in to this program.
Welcome to the Ken Rampersad Show. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you we have a special person watching our program tonight too. I know all of you are special, but she will be, what, be my guest next week. She is Dr. Veronica Jackson, will be on the program next week, and I'm so glad that she is also a Guyanese, and we will have a lot to talk about. Uh, we'll talk about her life. Um, uh, also, I... The part of this show, I want to encourage people to do, live their best life, to take their education. And so we will ask her how she made it. Mm -hmm. What are some of the sacrifices that she have made to become a doctor? And to be, she's working here in Queens. She seemed very pleasant. So, doctor, I am calling for you next week. We'll be talking. We want to encourage our young ladies to be someone just like you to be a good human being and to serve humanity and to make this world a better place. So thank you very much for tuning in, Doctor. Um, so I'll talk to you next week. We have um, Michael Nalini Naidu. Thank you for tuning in. Sandra Singh, um, one of the persons who have always supported us and this family and my two sons. I say thank you very much and thanks for being um, in this family. Um, Lena, I thank you very much for tuning in, my dear. And yes, um, Maria Harris, it's a lot of sacrifice we have to make in life. My friend all the way in Florida, Roxanne Walker Hamilton, thank you very much for tuning in. My friend all the way from Puerto Rico, C. Mendes Finch, and I wish you all the very best in your Finch show next week. I hope you take it away, my friend. Um, who else we have? Priya said, I am chocolate. Just kidding. Nice song. Let's get a chutney next. Maybe one of them rum song that maybe to be refrain, yes, we don't want to play that. Also, I want to say hello to Pamela Jeffers, um, Sanchez, thank you for tuning in, my dear. And so we have your, one of your songs song uh, is coming up not too long from now. I see Raymond Ramindranath, thank you for tuning in. Yes, we are trying, we are trying to play some nice songs for you guys. And we are talking about alcohol tonight. And uh, like I said, together with the three of us, we have 49 years of service. We will go back and forth, chit chat, so we can help you guys to understand what alcoholism is. And you know, I was going for my statistics, probably as we are talking, I can tell you, Saudi, I can ask you, you are from Guyana, and a lot of parents from Guyana does not understand what alcoholism is. I mean, they may have heard it, but as parents sometime, when their children drink, they quarrel on their children, they do all, say all manner of things. Do you think of someone who is addicted to alcohol, can they help themselves? Talk to me. Well, yeah. Um, first of all, yeah. Thank you. That's a good question, actually. Um, especially in our community in the United States, um, you know, uh, it's not just our community. It's uh, I think it's a collective of um, the kids under a drinking and the the pill usage and you know and all of that stuff. But uh, I'll keep it on alcohol because it's so easy to get, and because um, of the. The, the society and the thinking that it's, 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 um, it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, kids kids have, um, they have a lot of peer pressure at school. Uh, there's a lot of socioeconomic pressure on them. Um, so for when a kid starts drinking, I don't think a kid would have the ability to really help themselves. And what we tend to see, as you know, and as, as, as our friend here would tell us, the, the kids that come in for treatment or the kids that goes for treatment, uh, they, they're really, really bad off, you know, um, and, and sometimes it's um, life threatening. Uh, but somebody who's really suffering from it is very hard, especially for a kid to get out of it unless the parents do something. Um, usually that's what ends up happening. The kid um, end up in so much of a problem, you know, um, either they start getting into um, criminal activities or they start getting into fights or, you know, these kinds of things. And then by then, then the, re the family sometimes realize, you know, just in time or maybe too late. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure if you check the statistics on kids that uh, are committing suicide, um, you know, on all of these things, it, right. it all stems from from just this basic thing. You know, it could it could stem from this, or it could you know from other things. But alcoholism, as you said, it becomes a solution. So a kid can't deal with stuff at school. Uh, they can't deal with stuff at home. Um, what happens? Well, you know, I have a couple of friends. They're handling things fine because why? You know, after school they go, or even in school they leave school, they go out. They have a couple of drinks, you know. Uh, it's so easy. You walk into any deli. I mean, look, I'm not saying the deli shouldn't. Uh, that's not what this is about. Right, right. Uh, this is about the, the, the impact of this disease on people. So, John, if you can 
tell me in your, you know, you're an American guy. Um, what, how can we help parents to understand that, you know what, um, if you get addicted, how can we as parents help our children um, or even our husbands? A lot of uh, you and I, and we can get into the conversation. We see in our job that a lot of time parents come, they crying, especially from Guyanese. A lot of Guyanese that I know come and they cry that, you know, my son um, is drinking. What can I do? How can I help him? And the other thing is that as with, with the, the law, we are not allowed to see a lot of things about it. What's your take? Well, there's, there's family counseling, um, which I recommend that a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. um, because as you just said, uh, you know, kids today, um, they have access to so many things, not just alcohol, but other, other drugs, drugs, drugs. Uh, prescription drugs as well. So, you know, kids are, are now, you know, the peer pressure is almost parent pressure too. You know what I mean? They're under a lot of, a lot of, uh, pressure and kids have so much stress on them as opposed to, you know, kids back in the 60s, 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, they're under a lot of pressure. Most of them have to take care of themselves. Mm. Um, parents are working more than one job to try to make ends meet. And you got a lot of single parents and so forth and so on. And kids, so kids are, are really not parented the way they used to be parented back in the day. Mm -hmm. so, so therefore, a lot of these devices are open and available to them. Mm -hmm. And then you got the people that's, you know, promoting whatever it is, you know, the party drug, try the pill and this and that and the third. Mm -hmm. And so kids are, you know, they're open to these things. A lot of them are. They're open to, to these things, and they take them. So when you talk about, you know, the effect of, of alcoholism, especially here in America, uh, it's a huge, huge problem. It's really, really big in, in, here in America. Um, the average kid that uh, finds himself later on in addiction um, with, with they move past alcohol to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to real addiction, um, and I'm talking about drugs now, uh, the majority of them start early, like 10 years old. Wow. Yes, yeah. yes, I know that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, you know, it is a, a major problem. And other things happen, you know, pregnancies, teenage pregnancies, and so forth and so on, and that, they get that pressure too because now they could possibly be the, a father at a young age. Yes, I know, yeah. Which keeps driving the same addiction, that wheel of addiction. Yes. You know what I mean? And they go through that cycle, that vicious cycle, and some of them wind up in places like prison you know, mm -hmm. jail, detentions, and so forth and so on, and that even drives the wheel even further. Yes, yes. I see my sister uh, tune in, Miss uh, Anita from Canada. Um, thank you for tuning in. I see Rashida Rasul. Thank you for tuning in. Lena again, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, Girly Psad, Shelly Chunilal, all the way from Guyana. Thank you for tuning in. Um, let's go. Um, Let's go to some statistics again here too. Mm -hmm. Alcohol impaired driving account for more than 30% of all driving fatalities each year. More than 15 million people struggle with alcohol abuse disorder in the United States and elsewhere, but less than 8% of those receive treatment. Why, as we talked before, why are they not getting treatment? Well, I mean, for you to get treatment, you have to want treatment. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues or one of the primary uh, purpose for for alcoholics not getting um, not getting help is because of the denial, right? They'll deny, deny, deny. They don't want to be. They were the last one. Uh, 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 alcoholic will tell you, I was the last one to realize that I was the alcoholic or I am the alcoholic. That that's usually what it um, ends up being. So trying to get treatment. Um, so, uh, and you said some statistics before too, you know, 76% of men, right. um, suffer. Um, I want to say there's a high number of women, but you just don't hear it because women, um, just by nature, they try to hide it. Or they don't want people to know the embarrassment, you know, the social economic factor, all of that kind of stuff. Um, they don't, they don't want to come out. And, it, and in the general population in treatment, you will see that. You probably have, what, 25 guys and maybe two females That's looking correct. for That's treatment. That's correct. Yes. And, and, and you know the fact of the matter when you all walk down the street. I mean, yeah, alcoholics are alcoholics. They all do the same thing. It doesn't matter what you know what gender uh, what gender you are what what social economic background you come from where you come from which country they're going to act the same way they're going to do the same thing they're going to overdrink they're going to get in problems but that's you know one of the things 
is, um, and, and probably this is a whole different show that you, that you can tackle, where uh, women who face this, they don't want to... Uh, it's so embarrassing for them to come up and say, well, you know, I have a problem, what do I do? Uh, and you, know, you can you probably you know, speak more about that because you're actually in that field, and you see them coming, and the first thing you're going to tell you, well... Uh, you know, it's not so bad. It's just once in a while it happens. But, you know, as a professional. You know, while you were talking, it went through my mind. And guess what? Sometimes when I go to work, I, I will see someone from Guyana uh, of an Indian descent. And guess what? They would be so embarrassed. They would not want to, to look at me. Or sometimes they sign out. They don't stay for treatment. And, you know, I, I am there to help and to support everyone across the board. Um, I don't have a problem helping them. And a lot of times, uh, John uh, John and I work on the same shift in the morning time, and he would know that, you know, sometimes these guys would come and they just have on little clothes. They, sometimes mm -hmm. they come bare feet. They don't have anything. And I always have a conversation with John. I said, John, I'm kind of so surprised that, um, you know, this is the United States of America, and look at this guy just walking here with bare feet and his clothes. His clothes is so filthy. He hasn't taken a shower in four or five years. Sometimes John will tell you that we can't do the admission when they come in because they, they smell so terribly and we will have to let them go for a shower and then we will have to admit them. What's your take, John? Well, you know, a lot of people come from homelessness, uh, which is really, really big here in America, especially in New York City. Um, homelessness lands them in shelters. And when they go to shelters, there's plenty of uh, drugs there, mm -hmm. um, alcohol and drugs. And so by the time they, you know, they, they uh, waltz the streets, sleep on trains and things like that, um, eat out of garbage cans uh, in some cases, mm -hmm. um, you know, they do come uh, with a stench on them because of what they've been through mm -hmm. um, and the places they've been. I mean, you know, you can't get a wash on a subway. Um, you know, and people are sleeping on subways. You can't get a wash in a park, uh, and they're sleeping on park benches. Um, and things like this happen, you know, on cardboard underneath the, the uh, train trestles and things like that. This is where they're, they, they're at. And we're supposed to be able to meet them where they are. That's right. And, John, um, Lena just said something that's really important that I wanted to say. You have to comply and willing to go for treatment yourself. Yeah. What's your take? I, I believe that. I believe that. I think when a person is really tired of the, their, their situation, their present or current situation, that they find themselves throwing their hands up and surrendering. That's what you call um, bottom. You, rock bottom. Rock bottom. Yes. That's right. That's yeah. when you hit rock bottom, you come and you said, listen, I, I'm, and we have heard it so many times, mm -hmm. listen, I am tired. I am sick and tired and sick and tired of the run. Right, John? That's correct. Yeah, usually the, you hear something, you know, you're sick and tired of being sick, sick and, and tired, tired yes. you know. Yes. Uh, yeah, we can all <laughs> agree with those agree. lines. I know, I don't, we don't mean to laugh about it, okay? Right, Let's right. Just, just be careful Stay here. We, 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 because we identify what is going on um, with the alcohol. We understand what they go through. Uh, and sometimes the same guy that you talked to yesterday that said, I am willing, whatever, I'm going to do anything you tell me to do. And then you see him Monday morning, he's like, you know, it's not so bad, you know, I think I'm going to check myself out. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I don't, uh, yes, how many yes. times you would see that? I, I you, get mad you, sometimes, uh, oh, I get mad. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the thing, the alcoholic has the built-in forget it. Last weekend, he got thrown in jail. He got kicked out by the wife or husband, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the boss promised him, like, if, he could, if you can't show up on Monday, I'm going to fire you. And then this week he said, well, you know, it wasn't so bad last week. I'm pretty sure there's a way I can do this without ending up in the same problems. <laughs> and and this, is the, this is the nature of the disease. The nature of the disease is not only when the alcoholic is drinking, okay, because when he's drinking, we know, look, the guy is blown out of his mind. He can't walk a straight line. He can't see straight. He's kissing and hugging everybody or he's mm -hmm. cursing everybody out, whichever way he goes. Yes. But the nature of the disease is the alcoholic would not accept the fact until 
he says, I'm willing for help. And even then, even then, this is why the continued treatment mm-hmm. is needed, the outpatient is needed. Yeah, we'll you know, get to that. Count, right. But th- and that's that's the thing. Yes, the alcoholic is the you know, when he needs help, um, that's the only time or that's the best time. But then you gotta follow up because the nature of this disease is gonna mm-hmm. tell him after a couple of days, if the wife starts smiling with him again <coughs> yes. and he got the job back again mm-hmm. and he's able then he's gonna tell himself well, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad. I, I, I think I'm okay now, and and this is where, and it, mm-hmm. and it goes, and it's a cycle, and it's a cycle, and mm-hmm. that cycle can last for 10, 20, 15, you know, fifteen years yeah. uh, without even realizing it. <laughs> you know what? There's so much that we got to talk about, and l- we can f- chit chat for maybe four or five hours um, yeah. with all of the, with our experience. <laughs> and John, you and I know. Sometimes I would just John would say, uh, Rampersad. Or Ken, you have an admission, so I'll go, I'll do my admission. And in an hour time, John will come to me and say, guess what? The patient you just admit is leaving. And then sometimes their parents bring them, force them to come in for treatment. Mm-hmm. And after they bring them in treatment, guess what? They, as soon as the parent's gone, they say, listen, I'm not going to do this. And that's why we encourage people, when parents come for and bring their kids, let your ch- child want to do this. Or let your husband want to do this. Um, because if you're forcing them to do this, it's not going to happen. And we said more than 65 million American report been drinking in the past month, which is more than 40% of the total of current alcohol use. Teen alcohol use kill 4,700 people each year. That's more than an illegal drug combined. Drunk driving costs the United States more than $199 billion each year. And guess what? We know that one out of 10 pregnant women end up drinking and we all know that when a woman is pregnant and she drink a lot of things could go wrong with the child and my question to you guys again why do people um continues to drink and why they choose uh, and, and, and i know that you uh, both of you guys are gonna tear this away and why they choose alcohol over their wife why they choose alcohol over um their jobs and every other thing else. And th- and guess what? We see that some of the guys have some pretty, I see some of them have some pretty wives drive and bring them there and they cry and they're so disappointed. Take it away, guys. Yeah, but it really <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't matter because see, when, when alcohol has a hold on to someone, it's a, it's another relationship, mm. right? And that relationship becomes uh, vitally important because this isn't what, what happens with alcohol. A person could, could go get a bottle of alcohol, drink that bottle, and that bottle becomes his, his, best, his or her best friend. Right? Alcohol's not going to talk back. Right? Alcohol's not going to slap them. It's going to get them, you know, it's going to take that edge or whatever it is that they're looking for. It's going to give them that feeling that they're looking for. But at the same time, they fall in love with it. So it becomes like a first love. So then it's, a, it's the bottle versus the wife. That's right. That's right. right. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens. So the, the, the alcohol becomes a substitute. It could become a family. It becomes whatever they make it. My best friend, my buddy, mm-hmm. my wifey. It'd be all of those things to my a person. Boo. <laughs> my boo. Yeah. But, you, you know, and, and that's the nature of the disease, right? The obsession of the mind. Exactly. Right? It's a twofold disease. Uh, they'll tell you that. It's an obsession of the mind and mm-hmm. the compulsion of the body, right? The mind is so obsessed with it, it clouds out everything else. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, there are guys that, look, there, there are guys who were in the army and they couldn't function because they're alcoholics. Yeah, they, they gotta go jump out. They're a prior trooper. They gotta go jump out of tr- the plane tomorrow. Th- their life is on stake. They got too drunk to wake up to get on the <laughs> on the truck. To, yeah, uh, look, and these are the things. And and you know, we when you hear it, when you sit with somebody, mm-hmm. and they tell you what they go through, it's painful. I mean, now you know, sometimes you can laugh about it because you know that same person was able to t- turn their life around, yes, right? Yes, yes, But the obsession of the mind, it obsesses the person so much, they can't think straight. They can't do anything right. And and, and that is the, that's the nature of the disease of alcoholism. Mm-hmm. Once the obsession is in there, now it replaces everything else. Yes. The wife, doesn't matter what she looks like. 
Oh, whatever. You're going to find some problem. You're going to, and it's always the wife's fault, right? Mm-hmm. Every time you talk to an alcoholic in the bar, it's like, exactly. he is never at fault, or she is <laughs> never at fault. It's always them, that person, the in laws, the husband, yeah. the wife, the kids, the job, the boss. You know, it's always a finger pointing yeah. thing, right? Yeah. So, and, and that the nature of the disease is the obsession drives them to do things that you would not do as a normal person. Right, the abnormal becomes normal. Right. right. So here's the example: the obsession. A guy who's an executive, yeah. who has thousands, maybe millions of dollars, ends up sleeping on the street. You think that's a fairy tale? That's not a fairy tale, right? Exactly. There's a saying: park place to park bench, mm-hmm. and you see and you hear it. Yeah. Like sometimes you hear people, and you're like, "Oh my God, you're that person!" And you're like, "Why? Why? Why would you do this?" It baffles the mind. So the, the obsession drives the alcoholic so strongly, they're not able to think straight. The abnormal, which normal person would leave their family, leave their job to go live on the street because why? It's because nobody, they have no rules. Nobody mm-hmm. to tell them what to do. They, wherever they lay their hat, that's where they sleep in. And then, you know, and this is the problem. The obsession, um, uh, you, there's a way to break that cycle, right? There is a way, and I know you're going to talk about it, but um, I just want to get that in. The obsession is so strong with the alcoholic that you doesn't matter what you tell them. Yep. doesn't matter what you tell them. You just can't break through that shell. And the only thing that can break through that shell is, you know, the acceptance of the fact that, okay, maybe I do have a problem. And, you know, that's the thing. <laughs> Thank and you. I, I just wanted to, to add to what he just said because what's really <coughs> important is that alcoholism minimizes responsibility. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it makes you feel, and they feel, you start really feeling good about yourself that you didn't pay rent, you didn't pay bills, you didn't give no money towards your kids, and people start talking to themselves about these things when they're under the influence, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it sort of diminishes the responsibility aspect because now I get where I'm at and I'm drinking excessively and I'm numb to the responsibilities, Yes. And that's why, you know, when we talk, you talked about early about homelessness and stuff like that, that becomes a norm for them. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. Yes. You are correct. And, you know, it becomes a normal thing, like you said. And, John, my thing, and uh, one of the things why I have this program is to help people to understand certain things in life. And, um, like, for example, husband and um, wives and, and mother and father, um, you know what, you see that your, your partner or your children drinking all the time. And we know, we hear that don't beat them again. They are beating themselves so much. So what you guys need to do now is to support your children or support your husband. And we will talk about all of that, John. I know you can answer that a little too. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you support them? Um, and, and after that, we can go f- for some music. I know the conversation is getting heated. So let's talk. Uh, we, we're going to chit-chat a little bit. But what do you think, John? How do we... Um, and or, or you want us to, to, to go for a song and um, no, then we, we come continue. back? Go ahead, talk to me. So, so at what, what point do you want me to make? Um, wh- how, what, what the family, how should they support the, the, the family? Should they understand what's going on? Oh, you mean, the, you, you mean how they should treat the alcoholic? I think that's yes, what he's asking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you got to treat an alcoholic as normal, first of all, mm-hmm. um, because that's what you want them to become. So you can't treat them, uh, you know, at a low place because you're trying to lift them up. you you got to instill hope in them. Good. Hope. Right? Hope, so, guys. Hope. Yeah. Um, so I think the process of, of restoration is, is, is based on a person saying, you know, I love you regardless right. of where you are right now. Mm-hmm. I love you regardless of that. Right? So that unconditional love thing comes into play. Right? And you can only exercise that by showing it, right? So you can't like, okay, well, you know, you, oh, you smell, you know, you know, you can't yeah. do those things as you were saying before, you know, we're, we're not making fun of anyone. So they can't be made fun of because their self-esteem is going to go down. And that's, that's one of the issues that triggers using low self-esteem. Yes, yes. Um, so... Let let me read some shout out. I was gonna say something, but I just had a black. So let's go. Let let's read some. There's so much things. Hello, ladies. We, we want to talk about so many things. I have so many things to talk about, and I'm watching the time, and I want to give you guys some music. 
Um, so, so I see Janet Hussein. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, Michelle Persaud, thank you for tuning in, my dear. Um, who else? Roxanne Hamilton, sometimes it's mental illness and their families are wondering whether they are. And yes, we will talk. I'll try to bring in a little piece about that uh, mental illness. Um, Roxanne Hamilton, I have all of that to talk about and to help these guys to think. You know, I forget to say hello to my wa lovely wife, Gita Rampasad. I don't know where she's at, but I think she's on her way home. Um, you know, Gurley Pasad says, so I have a question. Why are they selling alcohol? And why they sell cigarettes and uh, said smoking is bad. You know what? I believe that human being, you know, we have a choice. They have the items there and the commodities there. And if you want to go take it, you take it there. Uh, or, you know, whatever it is. Also, it's a big business now. Alcohol and, and, and cigarette is a big business. So, um, you know, that, that's a sad thing. I see our, um, the, the man himself, Mr. Ryan Jeffrey. I'm tuning in. Thank you very much for tuning in, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please continue to share this program and continue to listen to this program. Um, you know, uh, even after we finish this program at 7 o'clock, I want you to continue to share this program. I want you to pay attention. This is very helpful. Like I said, within the three of us is 49 years of service. We have dealing with the homeless population, dealing with the alcoholics, the drugs, the uh, marijuana, cocaine, and everything. So, and if you want us to come back with crack, cocaine, marijuana in a separate thing, I could bring these guys back. So let me know in your shout box if you want me to bring them back sometime in January and we'll come back. I see Nadia, Nadia is, ba is on. Thank you very much, Nadia. And thanks for your friend request all the way from Canada. And you know, she is the queen of the man himself, Selector Abed. Thank you for tuning in, my dear. Let's, I see um, baby Amina Rathmatullah. She is in the studio, um, in the living room listening to. Thank you very much. So let's go to a beautiful song. You're listening to the Ken Rampersad Show on Island Zone Radio. Let's go.
Welcome, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Um, this is Island Zone Radio, the Ken Rampersad Show here. Um, we are having fun bringing this back, to bringing this to you guys. You see, we laughing. We were, we are, in fact, talking about how good time we are having, and I'm so glad that so much information is being uh, dispersed to you guys. So let's talk about binge drinking. You know, in 2017, the Center for Disease Control that showed that even though members had declined, teenagers were still drinking at dangerous rate. One in every six teenagers didn't drink, but only 1% of parents believe that their teenagers does drink. And one of you guys going to answer that question for me, so keep that um, in your brains. Um, binge drinking is not simply drinking a lot of alcohol. Um, it is not drinking a lot of alcohol in a short amount of time. It is the process of deliberately consuming more alcohol than the body can metabolize. I want to say that again. It is the process of deliberately consuming more alcohol than the body can metabolize. <coughs> Since men and women have different metabolic rates, the definition of Ben drinking for men is consuming, listen, five alcohol beverage within two hours. And for women, it's four drinks in two hours. The inability of the body to fully process this amount of alcohol in the blood leads to far more than just intoxication. Ben drinking causes dizziness loss of motor coordination, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, loss of consciousness. If a person vomits while unconscious, the vomits can block their airway, leading to death by suffocation. Um, various organizations and studies have identified when drinking as the most common, costly, and deadly pattern of excessive use of alcohol in the United States and around the world. While it is an exceptional danger for teenagers, adults also not less vulnerable. One in six adults binge drink at least four times a month, drinking as many as six drinks in a single two-hour episode um, period. Binge drinking occurs among men twice as much as it does for women across socioeconomic um, economics. The CDC found that being binge drinking tend to happen more among people who are rich, who make more than seventy-five thousand dollars are more than people who have lower um, income. And also the CDC found that in 2013, nearly 1.4 million people under the age of 20 took part of heavy drinking practices, consuming five drinks or more at least five times um, in a single month. So go ahead. Who wants to answer the question that I just asked? I forget the question. Uh, uh, binge drinking? Yes. Is it a binge drinking? Yes. Um, well, look. Um, I don't know. I, you know, you said the number. You know, um, people who are rich, seventy-five thousand or more. I don't right. think seventy-five thousand is rich. Uh, first of all, uh, but that's a different program. <laughs> um, look, um, yeah, because it, it, th there's a lot of misconceptions, right? Um, you know, people think, well, the only per the the kind of person who's an alcoholic is the guy who's drunk every day. That's not true. Right. Um, people might think, well, you know, um, if you only drink uh, once a month, you're not an alcoholic. That's not true. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the, the definition of an alcoholic. And as you said, right, the person uh, you said, if they drink more than the met metabolic metabolize, yeah. metabolizing rate. Right. Um, but the fact of the matter is um, the alcoholic um, is the guy who goes out for a drink, mm -hmm. and he's going to tell you, I'm going to drink only two drinks tonight. Mm -hmm. And then he shows up on Tuesday and says, I don't know what happened. Uh, you know, I just, <laughs> I just start drinking and just couldn't stop, right? Mm -hmm. And that comes with the other part. We talked about the obsession. Now this comes with the compulsion, the, the need to drink more and more and more. Mm -hmm. um, so the alcoholic is um, every time he drinks, every time he drinks, He's going to get, I shouldn't say he because, you know, just, well, yeah. I'm just using it as in the <clears throat> thing. Uh, he or she will get excessively drunk. Um, that is what happens. Um, in terms of um, socioeconomic background, um, I don't know. I don't know if there is a real distinction there because I, I don't see it. I don't know if you guys see it, but I don't really see that as a difference, you know. Well, yeah, I, c I could agree with that. Um I just feel that that a person that is a binge drinker, um, they they plan 
there is a plan in place mm -hmm. for a binge drinker. They just don't go wandering out saying, okay, I'm going to go on a binge. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's more like they think they can control the, their current situation, even though they're, they could be suffering from alcoholism. Um, and like you just said, they say, I, I'm only going to have two drinks, mm -hmm. right? And then they wind up uh, spending the night out drinking the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. 24 hours, like I said earlier, maybe 48 or whatever it might be. Um, I think binge drinkers are very, very dangerous because, you know, we talk about mind mood altering substances and alcohol is chief among them. Um, that alters the way that we behave. It alters the way our, our judgment is poor. We get behind the wheel of a car mm -hmm. and we drive um, and we'll hit someone. So in a lot of cases, they don't even know. They don't even realize they hit someone. Mm -hmm. They had a blackout. You know? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's very, very dangerous and it's very, very serious. And especially for young people because we just had about three months ago a young person behind the wheel of a car five other people in the car. They were coming from a ce little celebration. I forgot, was it a graduation or something to that effect? And totaled the car. My God. Four people in the car died. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so we can send out some greetings. I don't want to miss anybody. Oh, our friend Roxanne Chamber. Um, Roxanne from Faith Mission, is. Uh, she locked on. Okay. So I hope I could bring her on one time too. She has a wealth of knowledge, guys. I tell you, I'm, I'm so glad Roxanne tuned in. I miss working with you, and I'm hoping that I could be back very soon with you. Hey, Roxy. Sometime. You could say hello <laughs> to Roxanne. <laughs> hey, Roxy. <laughs> I see Salwan um, Solaba uh, listening from Canada. I think he is from Iraq. So I'm so glad that we have people listening from all over the place. Lena is on. I see Sheila. I want to say Sheila, Sheila Mangar Singh. Thank you so much for tuning in. She's always been encourage, n encouraging during the week. She always writes nice things. So, so that's a good thing. And I'm so glad that people are cheering me on. I see um, Bibi, um, Jenny Dubé uh, from Washington State or Washington, D.C. Thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, Ms. Kali Charan Bridgeban, Bridgeham, thank you for tuning in. Um, Let's see who again there. Yeah, Miss Dubey. Nadia Nadia is back again. Thank you very much. Jeffers says that she's enjoying our conversation, and I'm glad that you guys are doing. Guess what? Oh, another guy from Faith Mission is here. Your working partner, Mr. Leon Sid Martin. He says, power to the brothers. Beautiful program. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, did I see Select Abit? I see Select Abit is on. Thank you very much, my brother, and welcome again to Island Zone Radio. We are a team, my brother. Um, so thank you very much for tuning in. Um, Debbie, S Debbie Sanyasi, thank you for tuning in. Um, to all of you guys who are supporting me in this journey, um, I want to say thank you very much, and I cannot say thank you enough to you guys because one of the, the reasons I want to do this, pro I'm doing this program, is to enlighten you guys in so many things that we are exposing, exposed to like this three of us that you see here. We have seen so many things that bother us, and we want to share them with you guys and, and even help you guys um, for those who are drinking. We want to encourage you to seek treatment. And I could let, um, go with this discussion. I'm going to ask this question so these guys can jump right into it. Um, with we see these people. How do we encourage them to go get treatment? Um, you got your husband. Do you fight with them? Do you say, man, listen, you're sick, whatever it is. Go get treatment. How do we go? Well, ultimatums have never been successful. Mm. So I know that's not the right route because um, most people that, you know, are told, if you don't do this, if you don't go into treatment, then you can't live here. Mm. Right? We don't uh, do that. We don't tell them. No. If you don't get treatment, you can't live here. Right. What we want to say. Because you're, make, you're, you're, you're pushing them into further into the addiction. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. Okay. And, you know, so now a person becomes homeless, right? And then, then what happens, right? Is he's the person that's, that maybe robs a, a lady on the street because of his addiction. Good. We're going to talk about that. Keep that thought, too. Right. So, you know, we got to understand all these things. And, and, you know, of course, we have to set boundaries with with our loved right. ones. We, we know we have to do that. Um, we can't uh, become enablers and enable them because that's wrong too or codependent. Can you expound on that, discuss what enables mean? Because sometimes, you know, I want to bring language so that our viewers can l understand what we are talking about. Right. 
So an enabler does this. I don't want to see them sick. Right. right? Mm-hmm. So, so I'd rather go out and get them a bottle, you know, okay. whatever it might be, mm-hmm. so they won't be sick. Yeah. Or, or the parents. The right. parents will tell the kid, well, don't do it on the road. It's okay if you do, do it, it at, at home. home. Yes. Right? And that's enabling. Yeah. Yes. Is that like you're condoning what they are doing? I see my friend Marcia Lewis all the way from Kingston, Jamaica. Um, she is an ICU nurse, a registered nurse, and a nurse manager. I think she is in Florida, my dear. Thank you so much for tuning in to this program, the Ram, um, Ken Rampersad show. So let's go, guys. Yeah, so I mean, mm-hmm. uh, th- and, and this is a, a very important thing because it comes up, um, it's the first step in trying to get somebody help. If it's not handled properly, mm-hmm. it can blow up. You know, there's a guy, um, his wife say, you know, y- you're drinking too much, right? Uh, I'm going to leave the house. So what he says, he said, no, 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 no. You keep the house. I leave the house. And he became homeless, mm-hmm. right? You give an alcoholic an ultimatum, the obsession of the mind, right? That's one. That's overpowering. It doesn't matter. He will forego or she will forego the family for the bottle. Mm-hmm. Yes. He will forego the job for the bottle, right? And that's just a simple fact. So what you want to do is you want to handle it properly, right? You you give an alcoholic an ultimatum, they would just uh, if if he goes to work and the job and the, and <laughs> jo- and the boss say, well, listen, John, you come back drunk Monday, you don't have a job. Yep. The, what he's gonna tell the boss? You know what? You can do with your job, and uh, he's going to use that line, take the job and shove it. Yep. That's what he's going to do. That's right. And if uh, every alcohol, most alcoholic you talk to, you Mm -hmm. ask them, at some part in their story, Mm -hmm. that comes up. Well, you know, the wife told me I can't drink no more, so I left her. You know, or the job said I can't do this, so I just go find a new job. Or just don't work. And then it leads to the other things that happen, you know. (laughs) So, I mean, what is the right way to do it? Um, communication. Yes. Um, having them accept the fact that they want help. The alcoholic mm-hmm. has to say, or in some way or form, say, "Well, you know what? Maybe I need some help, or I would like to get some help." Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, the person or the individual is the one that has to take the first step. I might love my my son or my father or my brother or my sister. But I can't do it for them. They, you know, every journey begins with the first step. Yes. And they need to make that first step on their own. Mm-hmm. Because if they're doing it because you're telling them to do it, they're going to wake up three months from now and they're going to say, well, I never really wanted to do this. I'm only doing it because you told me I have That's to right. do it or else I can't be in the house. And they can't work. do it. Yeah, you can't right. do it for that reason. Mm-hmm. You simply have to get them to admit the fact they're an alcoholic and do it for themselves. Right. Yep. Um, and, and, and you hear that story so many times. The guy says, you know, I'm doing it for the family. Right. And then he gets mm-hmm. sober or he stopped drinking. Mm-hmm. And then six months later, if something happens and the wife says, well, I'm leaving you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it really wasn't the alcohol. It seems like you are the hell of the problem. Mm-hmm. And, and they leave. And then he goes back to drinking because he yeah. never did it because he wanted to get sober. He did it because he wanted mm-hmm. the wife to feel happy. So the person doing it, and, and that, that is the thing. Um, if you have a family member, if you have somebody that you know that, um, that are going through these things, if you don't know how to speak to them or you don't know how to, to approach them, there are places you can go to. There are people you can talk to. Um, you know, you have all the different centers, alcohol abuse center. You can get a counselor to give you some mm-hmm. idea. And the best way to do it, because maybe you might only have one shot at it. Mm-hmm. One shot at it. And if you don't, probably, I'm not trying to put pressure on people. I'm just saying do the responsible thing. Uh, the wagging your finger and locking the door and locking them out in the cold is not always the best solution. It might work once in a while, but it's not always the best solution. So, and, and the enabling thing, you know, if you think enabling somebody to kill themselves is a good idea, then maybe you have a problem too. So because what you're doing, That's if you're giving them, if you if you have kids and you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy you the liquor so you don't have to go on the street and get arrested. Or I, I know ki- parents allow the kids to smoke in the backyard, mm-hmm. I, you know, and they're not smoking cigarettes, they're smoking the other stuff. And I, I, 
that's not normal. That's not normal behavior yes. for family, you know, you're helping them kill themselves. Yes. So, you know, enabling is sometimes drag on the disease mm -hmm. and it gets them sinking deeper and deeper because now what, what is the alcoholic is going to say? Well, you know what? My wife ain't so bad with it. So I guess I can do <laughs> whatever right. I want. <laughs> uh, there is no end in sight. And, yeah. um, you know, and it becomes, it becomes really, and then it becomes truly a family disease. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about alcoholism. It's not just one person suffering. If they're in a family yeah, unit, yeah. the entire family is suffering. Sometimes the extended family. So it, it's a disease that uh, it, it's it's like a tornado through the family. Mm -hmm. It just spins everything out of control. It eats everything up. Yes, I see. Um, you know, I was laughing uh, and smiling because I see Miss Kalitran. She said her husband was a rum sucker. I'm such a typical Guyanese stock. I want That's to. Friendly Guyanese. <laughs> yes. I see Miss Nafiza Noor. Um, she tuned in. Thank you very much for logging on to the Ken Ramper Sot Show. And welcome anytime. Um, please share my program and encourage your friends and uh, family to watch the Ken Ramper Sot Show. You know, signs and symptoms of abuse, knowing that signs and symptoms of alcohol abuse is an important part of getting help. If you suspect someone that you know is um, that you love is struggling with an alcohol use disorder, look for the following warning sign. Pay attention, guys. This is what you're going to look for. Pro problems at work or school because of drinking, engaging in dangerous activities such as driving while drinking, blackouts and not being able to, uh, to remember what happened while you were drinking, legal problems such as being arrested or harming someone else while drunk, continuing to educate in spite of health problems that are made worse um, by alcohol. Example, you know, some people get um, liver disease, heart disease, and diabetes. Um, friends and family members who are worried about your drinking. And you know what, despite how much their family worried or whatever it is, it's always the person who have the problem will have to step up to the plate. Like Saudi and John was saying, they have to agree and said, you know what, I need help and I need treatment for this. So we're going to go for a song and um, when we come back, we will be talking again and you're watching and listening to the Ken Rampersad Show on Island Zone Radio. <laughs>
मुझे सुन सुना थी वही तू Welcome back to the Ken Ram Prasad show ladies and gentlemen um I want to say um welcome to my aunt Delari Sigobin she is watching the program too a uh, Robert Ramp thank you very much for tuning in to the Ken Ram Prasad show I hope you guys um continue to share the program um you know so we can share with each other um you know some of the problems that alcohol really how it damages our uh, affect our family dynamics here in the United States and around the world so I, Maureen, thank you very much. I see all your love you're coming with. Thank you so much. Um, Nafisa Noor says, good evening, Lee Nye. She said, yeah, and my dear. So, yes, thank you guys for tuning in. Let's see who else here. I, I want to catch all of you guys while I'm looking and see because the, the screen is, is moving so fast. Um, so let's talk now. Um, I'm going to give you guys from a nursing point of view now some of the signs and symptoms of alcohol abuse. And here it is. Alcohol, and I'm going to tell you guys by hours. Alcohol withdrawal symptoms following timeline, like 6 to 12 hours, the person will ex uh, um, exhibit signs like agitation, anxiety, headache, shaking, nausea, and vomiting. And there's so many times our patient come in and you see they're shaking, um, and it's, it's a sad thing. When within 12 to 24 hours, if they don't get any alcohol to drink, they start to get disorientation. They handle tremors. They can also get seizures, um, and that's how serious it is. Um, 24 hours, uh, 48 hours post-ingestion, we have seizures, insomnia, high blood pressure, tactile, auditory, and they will get hallucination. They will hear things or see things. So this is all that makeup stuff. This is what they are going to experience. They will get delirium, tremors, high fevers, and excessive sweat. So... <coughs> If you are the family member for these guys and you see that they're experiencing any kind of signs and symptoms, the best thing that you can do for your family is to call 911 and get uh, um, a detox for them to go. Let them go to the hospital because you don't want them to get any seizures and that they will end up in problem. Like, you know, they could fall, they could get a fractured skull and all these things. So, John, since that you are a counselor, um, mm -hmm. and you know, how, when a patient comes in, what are some of the want? To, I know you guys meet with the clients mm -hmm. on a one-to-one -one session. What are some of the things that you really discuss with your clients and how you do it? Mm -hmm. Well, for the most part, what we do is from the intake uh, of a client, we have to do the assessment um, to see whether or not they're appropriate for the program. program. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes someone comes in and they could uh, have just on a run, they could have just used drugs like 10, 15 minutes before they came in the door. Mm -hmm. And so it's based on, um, you know, we take a toxicology. Um, we have a 12-panel test, and it shows what kind of drugs are in their body. Right. We breathalyze them to see if they have alcohol in their bodies as well. So we test their, their um, blood alcohol levels. Um, if a person is... Uh, let's just say above 1.5, then they automatically get sent to the hospital. Right. Uh, they go to the hospital, they are detoxed at the hospital, then they're sent back to the facility for admissions. So, you know, and then bringing them in, you know, of course we have to ask them a series of questions when the last time they used and things like that. Um, what they used and their primary drug of cho choice to see if they're going to, if they're detoxing, mm -hmm. if they need detox, if their withdrawals are so strong and severe that they need detox. Mm -hmm. So they may have to go to detox for a few days and then come back to us. Um, but primarily that's what we do. We, um, we do the assessment. They go to a medical assessment. Um, then they go to a clinical assessment. Um, and those assessments are all necessary to see exactly where this person is because they could have been out there for six months, could have been out there for a year. Um, most of them don't even, can't even recall when the last time they worked. Mm -hmm. So all of these things factor in as to how, what kind of services we have to provide to them to get them back, uh, you know, walking straight and narrow, so to speak. So that's what we do. And um, let's say that someone comes in and they are homeless. What do you do? Do you l discharge them on the street, um, or do you refer them to um, to uh, uh, another long-term care? How do you guys do it, and how you 
um, differentiate if someone needs long-term treatment mm -hmm. what do you do well through the assessment we can we can find that out because we know how often they use that's what assessment is about how frequent they use when's the last time they use how long they were out on the run mm -hmm. And those things are, are all factors in determining whether or not a person needs a long-term treatment. You have a person, I'll give you an example, that mm -hmm. um, not that we make light of marijuana, but a person could have been smoking marijuana excessively and they're not, they're not getting to work on time and things like that happen. Maybe they lose a job or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but normally people on marijuana, you know, it's... You know, even if they commit a crime, it's 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 not a significant one. It's like a misdemeanor or a fine type thing or a violation mm -hmm. type situation, um, because there's there's uh, there's not the same demand of the other drugs that the other drugs present. For instance, cocaine is very expensive, and so is heroin. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about alcohol now. Alcohol is probably the least expensive out of all of those chemicals that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we assess the person, see how long they've been using, um, how long they've been on this run, and um, we, we sort of engage them into what type of service that they want because it's all about them. Treatment is person-centered, so we got to go with what they want. Mm -hmm. So if a person says, well, you know, well, I could do 90 days. Mm -hmm. So we try to find them a program that is a 90-day program that they can go into, and we encourage them to do aftercare afterwards mm -hmm. um, and to connect with some NA, you know, self-support services. Yeah, we will talk about services. that in a minute. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so that's basically what we do. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned, and uh, I, it seemed throughout the program, um, I think we, we don't, ha don't want any miscommunication. Um, we talk about the low-bottom trunks, mm -hmm. um, the guys who come off the street and don't have a job and all of that. Yep. Uh, but make no mistake, the guy driving a BMW that lives next to you can be an alcoholic too. Yes. Um, the difference is he's probably not going to go to one of the places uh, around where we, we are right now. They're probably going to go to Malibu, <laughs> uh, Malibu a retreat, or that's what they call it. And um, so uh, ju just so that we are clear, um, we, we're not just saying, well, you know, only people that live on the street are alcoholics, okay? Right. Um, exactly. The socioeconomic impact of, of alcoholism um, is a broad spectrum. It goes to, you know, you can be whatever. And as, as, as Ken was saying before, you know, some people, because they make more money, they tend to drink a lot more because they have more access or easy access. It, it's, easily, it's easily washed under because they, they're in so many business meetings and so many dinners and so on, you know. So, I mean, some of the causes, I mean, um, genetic, psych psychological, social, and environmental factors can impact how much drinking alcohol affects your body and behavior. So even these things, um, you know, depends, you know, if I lost my job, of course, I'm not going to be reacting the same way as the guy mm -hmm. who has a job, who has all the money in the bank, and he's an alcoholic. It would be two d distinctly different people. Yes. Um, and, and when they come in for treatment, they... Mm -hmm. You know, you see that as well. Um, so, f for for um, for the alcoholics, um, you know, over time, you know, um, it, it it truly affects you, and it's a mental disease. Um, so it does have um, lasting effect on the brain. Yeah. I think we even get to the wet brain, hmm. um, and, and and that is a significant um, thing. I mean, once you have it, that's it. You, there's no cure for it. You know, and um, the, the withdrawals from alcohol can kill you. Make no mistake, it is more deadly. And you guys are nurses; you can you can attest to this. The 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 withdrawal from alcohol is even more dangerous than getting withdrawal from heroin. Oh yeah, and, and cocaine. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. You know the DTs. Uh, you can right. shake so bad that you know you just you know you go into you get a heart attack. So I mean it's 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 a serious serious disease so if you have somebody uh that you know i mean try to get the proper help and this is why it's it's really important when you're approaching that person for them to get help that it's done properly so you don't spoil that chance you know we know that um you know steady drinking over time um, too much on a regular basis for an extended period of been drinking on a regular basis can lead to alcohol related problems or alcohol use disorder we know that family history, um, it's the risk of alcohol use disorder is highly is higher for people who have a parent 
or other close relative who have problems with alcohol. And we, we, we do that in Ghana. You know, you're drinking, you would, your family would say, come take a drink here, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't understand what's really going on, you know what I'm saying? So I, I've had that many times. In fact, when I was a young boy growing up, there was this guy I met on the road and he said, man, take a drink. And that guy, I said, no, I don't drink. I was well, probably about 15, 16 years old. And he choked me so hard, <laughs> like I spit blood when he finished. And I thought that was so <laughs> foolish of him to do. You, you know. tell me who it is after. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's dead now, so uh, that's a sad thing. You don't know him. But, you know, and these are some of the things that really happen at a young age. We know depression and other mental health problems. Um, it's common for people with mental health disorder, such as anxiety, depression, and schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder, to have problems with alcohol and other substances. And John, you and I know, and I've always wondered to know that like when I'm doing a, a admission, uh, uh, I see patients, like a lot of them who have a history mm -hmm. of depression or so on, they have a problem drinking mm -hmm. um, alcohol or using drugs. Mm -hmm. What is that your experience too? Oh yeah. Yeah, for the most part, I mean, the average person that comes in, just the average person that comes in, um, has been on some many runs, um, you know, throughout the course of a, of a year, two years, three years, four years. Um, and so most people, uh, like you said, we don't really want to say people that hit rock bottom, really hit rock bottom are the people that we focus on, because that wouldn't be true. Um, some people still have some things in place, and, 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 and it, it doesn't excuse, doesn't make them, you know, less than or, or you know, they're like their addiction is not as, as, as relevant as the other ones. Everybody's the same. It's, everybody's the same. So the bottom line is um, when, when we see this and, and we want to help people, um, the one thing, they have to be open enough to receive. And I think that's the key to beginning, to a new beginning for most of these people. They just have to be a little open, just a little open, enough to receive. Because what happens is they, they're already, you know, they're very guarded. Mm -hmm. They got, you know, they got their guards up, and they pretty much know every kind of question that you may ask them or you may say to them or statements you may make to them. They're prepared for that. Mm -hmm. They've heard it before mm -hmm. and they, many times. They're always going to lie. The exactly. alcoholic, one of the, the, mm -hmm. the trait that they have is when you ask them a straight, how mm -hmm. much you drink? What did, uh, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> They're never going to tell you, right? That's I mean, right. How many times? They're always going to minimize their use. <laughs> always. That comes with the territory, yeah. I may say. Yeah. And it's not that bad. They'll say things it's not that bad. You know, They don't realize what they did You know, because self-destruction is not something spoken of. We don't speak of that that much. You know what I mean? Um, so self-destruction is, is, is one of the things that happens, especially with alcoholism. Mm -hmm. You know, you tend to destroy everything that you had your hands on. Mm -hmm. You lose everything you had your hands on. Right. And these things start yeah. happening. I don't care about the, the person that's driving, still driving a nice vehicle. and stuff. He's lost somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. He's lost some stuff. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's not that it's, the person is okay because they still got 40000 in the bank. Maybe they had 400000 before they started. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yes. Um, also, we, we spoke about like one in 10 pregnant women, they drink alcohol mm -hmm. and, um, during pregnancy, and it may cause fatal um, alcohol syndrome, resulting in giving birth to a child who has physical and development problem. Um, in the lifetime and you know I always wonder and I've always it's a sad thing that to see that a mother who is pregnant will drink alcohol knowing that that child could um, end up having birth defects uh, yes um, so so you could see that the alcohol really has a hold on a lot of people mm -hmm. a lot of alcoholics and they do a lot of things um, yeah. also if you have diabetes it's it could um, cause problem for you alcohol um, you have sexual function in, in male um, mm -hmm and in menstrual problem in females. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you very much. Um, we are not going yet, but I always, always want to say thanks to you guys for watching this program. I see Diamond Vibes. Thank you for tuning in. I see um, uh, our friend from Canada is um, tuning in. I see Roxanne says, um, Roxanne said, what she, she start drinking, she get a first shot. No, let me say it right. I have my first taste of XM at age eight years old, and I love it. She said that she's laughing from my grandfather, and to this day, I still have a drink, and it's okay. Nobody's not saying that you're not supposed to drink 
or you don't take a shot. You know what? Go take a drink now and again. Uh, you know, it's good for the heart and, and so on. Also, I would like to welcome and say thanks to Shabir Baksh. He is the guy from the No Janjat, no Janjat Group, always supportive to this program. I say thank you very much and welcome. Diana Chunilal, all the way from Guyana. Thank you for tuning in to this program. We're going to ask our DJ to get a song lined up for us. Um, so we will be back and we'll talk to um, to Saudi, um, see what else he has for us. Let's go.
Island Zone Radio. So, you know, one of the advice I have for you guys is that if you see someone is drinking, um, don't let it stop drinking um, immediately like that. Try to get a supervised detox. Don't let it do it at home because guess what? As we said, you can have see, you can experience seizures, disorder, or um, vomiting, diarrhea, and so on. So it's always good to go to the hospital and get a supervised detox. Right, John? Yeah. We have seen so many times that guys came in to our detox and they mm -hmm. complain and they lie to us and mm -hmm. they're telling us, you know what, oh, I drink what one week ago or two months mm -hmm. ago. And then guess what? After a couple of days, a day or two, um, we see they start to experiencing all these um, Withdrawal. de de withdrawals. And mm -hmm. so um, we have to send them to the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, a lot of there's there's been a lot of cases like like that. Um, unfortunately, you know, a person come in and they try to fight it on their own. Think they're strong enough to to go through it on their own, and all of a sudden, um, you know, they start eating a little bit, and they start vomiting, and and you know, diarrhea kicks in with a lot of them, and they start having all sorts of issues, and we have to send them out uh, to detox. That's that's correct. Um, uh, let's see. Um, that song that you were listening to, one of our viewer here, um, that's Gerli Prasad and Vishal Munisar. Um, always a, a pleasure having her on the program. And she's such a talented singer. I plan to play most of the songs on this program um, from our local talent from Guyana, Trinidad, or Suriname. Um, so I want to uplift our own people, if you know what I mean. So during the during um, the the week coming up, you will hear a lot of our own people singing our song, um, which is a good thing to do to promote our own people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're gonna play a Lenormand song. Who's that? Well, what's the guy's name? Ah, oh, gosh, I can't forget. He lives right not too far away from us. He had oh, his big. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If I get his song, I'll play it. I'd love to. to help our own people. Also, <laughs> we were talking while we were in a you were listening to the music. Um, how can we really help children and uh, the teenagers? Mm -hmm. um, is there any system in place how we can really help them? Yeah, we, there's a uh, youth prevention. Um, they're now offering it in schools, um, after school. They're offering it with the parent as well as parents, I'm sorry, with the children. Um, and it's to educate them about uh, peer pressures and things like that um, and to get them, you know, there's bullying and things like that that happen, I guess, most of it on social media. Um, kids are actually offered uh, drugs on social media. Wow. So um, a lot of this stuff happens and, you know, the child may go and tell the parent or whatever, how did you find out about such and such? And they'll discuss it a little bit, but they really don't have knowledge uh of the substance period and so they offer these particular programs um, for youth youth prevention programs mm -hmm. there's a youth specialist and they mm -hmm. also have peer spe specialists also right. that actually go out into the various different communities um, letting them know about you know someone let's say for instance if there's a young adult that's now smoking weed and he can't stop but he got his, himself or herself in some sort of trouble so they now have these spe peer specialists that actually go out in the, in the community, talk to these youths about you know their situation, the court case, what led to it, and so forth and so on. So education is key. It's getting them the information that they don't know, um, and they learn. They get to learn about uh, pharmacology, which is learn about what drugs and the effects of drugs, and they learn about these things. I think it's very, very good. It's, it's, it's excellent way for them to become educated. And then kids also share with other kids what they learned. 
So it, it catches on, you know what I mean? Oh, I didn't know that happened, though. Yeah, you know, they talk like that because you'd be surprised the conversation that children have. Yes, I hear them sometimes. Mm -hmm. And John, I want you to explain, uh, before I let you explain this, I see a very good friend, Chris Alberto, World Block Boss. Thank you very much for tuning in, tuning in, my brother. And he is one of the guys who have really come here and try to help me with a computer and so on. So I say thank you very much. Um, it's good to have you as a friend. So, John, uh, you know, I don't want to miss anybody, really, and mm -hmm. all those who have really contributed towards yeah. this success. Yes. I am really appreciative of all of that, you know what I'm saying? So the thing is that when we talk about peer specialists, um, who is a peer specialist? Well, a peer specialist is someone very, very close to that person's age. So it could be a younger teenager that is actually hired, right? It could be by the hospital, by a, a, a medical center. It could be a person that's actually hired by a drug treatment program for youths. And what they do is mo a lot of them work as court advocates as well. Mm -hmm. So if you have a person that um, maybe they have a case or something like that, you get a person that goes there and that they sort of mentor them. Mm -hmm. And they show them a better way. They show them what life is about and what to stay away from and you know who to befriend and things like that. Those things are very, very important. Because a lot of times what happens is, you know, if you're hanging out with the wrong person, you know what happens. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can start getting offered things that, that, you know, you don't even know what you're taking. Yeah, the people, places, and things. People, in places, there, and things, know, yes. Who you hanging out with. Show me your friends, and I'll tell you who you are, right? Exactly. Um, you know, and, and for kids especially, uh, some of the earlier signs is probably mm -hmm. if you talk to any parent, you know, this kid was a straight-A student. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, he's not so much a straight-A student. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you want to know what's going on. It's always good to look into it. And then mm -hmm. as parents... You just got to be a good, good example. Like, you yeah. can't tell the kid, well, you can't do this. And then in the on the weekend, you're in the backyard doing all of that. Mm -hmm. And then you're telling the kid, well, you can't do this. You, you know, it's we have to be the heroes and, and the examples that we want for our kids. Yes. Um, we can't expect the teachers to do it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't expect, a, you know, um, you know, when they go to the church, you know, talk to the pre. Yeah, but. Uh, again, there's some responsibilities to the parent. And then, you know, and, and, and that's the other thing, because sometimes you have single parent. Right. Uh, and, 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 you know, unfortunately, um, in New York, uh, you, you know, there, there's a lot of that, and it becomes very hard. So the best way, the best way is mm -hmm. to get the education that's needed. Um, even if you think your kid is okay, still get some feedback and get some information because you never know. It might not be for your kid. It might be the neighbor kid who's having a yeah. problem and you can still help. That's right. Um, so, you know, try to educate yourself a little bit because the, the thing about the kids these days, you know, they are vastly uh, advanced in technology and yes. social media than any of their parents. You know, I mean, I, I, I know computers a little bit, but, you know, my, my 14 year old son, you know, he, he's doing a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I, you cut off the Internet. That's what you do, people. You cut the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you just got to be careful. You got to be responsible. Um, and, and these are some of the things, um, especially our community. Yes. Um, they don't pay too much attention to it. Um, so, you know, all the all the parents that came from Guyana and now are living here and you have kids, this is, uh, you know, they're facing these issues because they're not attuned to what's going on in, in New York. They don't know the life. You know, we're accustomed back home. You go to school and you go home. Yeah, well, here it's not like that. It, it's, it's vastly different. So for especially kids, go to the, the, the program, uh, go to the school, talk to the counselors, um, you know, get get this kind of education because you need it. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes, if you don't get it, then you you'll feel you know the brunt of the of the, or the impact of the issues. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. So we're gonna go. Um, I think our DJ is ready for a song now. And when we come back, we will talk about the aftercare after you went through detox. Mm -hmm. What do you do mm -hmm. after that? So um, get think of what you guys gonna say. Mm -hmm. So we ready, DJ? You're listening to the Ken Ramper song. Hey, Malibu, that's in studio. Do you want to think, man? Some friends you cherish and tell you get old.
Just listen to the words, ladies and gentlemen. You cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Petals will fall when you walk into that path. You are that special person with a big bull and heart. You are a leader, so humble and kind. You gave to another, you never did mind. Some friends who cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Some friends you cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. When you are down, you always look up. When you are up, you never look down. When you are down, you always look up. When you are up, you never look down. Get rid of the old and welcome in the new. Everything you do, we can try back at you. Some friends who cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Some friends you cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Needed your help and knocked at your door. Look who is rich and you're watching who is poor. Needed your help and they knocked at your door. Look who is rich and you're watching who is poor. The higher you go, the harder you will fall. You see who is big, you see who is small. Some friends you cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Some friends you cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Don't worry about your friends in this world They only here really just playing a role Don't worry about your friends in this world They only here really just playing a role Because when you are well I will defend And still be your friend Friends stay the end Some friends you cherish until you get old some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Some friends you cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Petals will fall when you walk into that path. You are that special person with a big goal and heart. You are a leader so humble and kind. You gave to another, you never did mind. Some friends you cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Some friends you cherish until you get old. Some are like diamonds, some are like gold. Welcome guys back to the Ken Rampersad show here. Um, it's here every ma every Sunday afternoon between the hours of 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And you know, yes, I want to play a lot of songs, but I also want to share a lot of information with you guys. It's unfortunate we can only cho choose about um, six to eight songs to play. And like I said before, this show is not about, I'm not, it's not a DJ, I'm a talk show host. Um, I want to share information with you guys. There were so many um, DJs around. Every time you turn, there is one, and I support all of them. All of them. So, um, 
I would, in time to come, I'll play everybody's song, especially for the locals, um, because I want to support you guys. It's not about the Indian the, the, in the songs alone that you, you guys want to hear. And this song that I just played is a young man who is from, um, he is in um, Canada and singing about how you can protect women and he's always support women's right. And so I'm hoping to interview him one day. So people like him, I will be, um, will be supporting and I'll be playing his song. And uh, people who are watching my program and as a little celebrity or whoever it is, I will support them too. I will support everyone who supports me. And I even go beyond it and play everybody's song. Um, so that's what that. So let's continue. Our time is coming short. I see Juliet Dial. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, so let's go, guy. Oh, Shabir Baksh again. I see you. Yes. So let's go. How do we help these patients after they have completed their detox in the hospital? What do we do? How do we follow up their care? Any one of you guys could take the question. Well, I think um, engaging them in the process of recovery. Um, that doesn't happen that often, as it should, but they need to know that the, the road to recovery is just beginning. So if you went to the first stage, as you talked about, going into detox, um, getting the chemicals out of their body, getting them stabilized, uh, so now we got to engage them in the process. And that process could be long for some. Um, when you talk about six months, yeah. Uh, and things like that. Um, you you know, have transitional housing for transitional, the homeless guys yes. and you know, so on. Um, yeah. And what I want to get at, and I really want to put this out there, I want people to understand, um, you know, despite we share a lot of information, there are some things that I will expound on mm -hmm. or something I will really stress on. I want to stress to you guys too, and John and, 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 and Said, um, you guys could talk. I believe and I know that the road to recovery, you will lapse sometimes there is relapse during the road to recovery. What do you guys think? It's not because you get detox, that means, hey, it's all good and dandy, and guess what? It's going to be done. There is continued care, and probably you can talk. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, Sorry. look, not because somebody goes to a detox and, you know, to stop drinking. It's not a cure, right? Um, alcoholism or addiction, so to speak, there's no cure. No known cure. You can check medical records. They have no cure for it. So the, the, the cure or, or the daily reprieve you would have is based on how much you work at it, okay? Um, so the, the, the guy coming out of the detox, going to the rehab for 30 days, some have long-term care, right? That's mm -hmm. what it's called, like one year, two year, whatever the case may be. People go through all of that, and as soon as they go back home, the very next week, they get drunk, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of them don't make it back. Like some of them that make it back, you hear the stories. Some of them, they don't because they go out mm -hmm. and they think their body is the same and they want to drink the same amount of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Because when you start drinking, after a period of staying away from the drink and you pick up the drink again, you go back right where you were. But here, there's a difference. Your body adjusted already. So now you want to drink the same amount mm -hmm. or you want to do the same amount of crack or mm -hmm. heroin. Mm -hmm. and you OD the first night, and you're dead, and there's no coming back from that. So, the, you know, the, the aftercare is very important. And, and if you can yeah. talk a little bit about AA, what AA really does? Right, well, there, there's there's a various um, types of 12-step program, right? Uh, I'm not here for any 12-step program, but I'm just going to tell you, um, because you go to the medical field, um, you, you know, you go in the state program, whatever the case may be, and then you come out and then you're on your own. Mm -hmm. um, there are numerous, numerous programs. There's the, the, um, the aftercare program that you can go to, the long-term program yep. um, that, that's all over, you know, mm -hmm. it's all across New York, United States. Uh, and then there have 12-step program. There's many 12-step programs as you need for whatever it is, um, whether it be alcohol, um, narcotics, marijuana uh, mm -hmm. program, nicotine anonymous, overeating anonymous, uh, you know. So there's so many things um, that you can do um, along with getting the medical aspect. Yes. Um, a lot of the 12-step program uh, based on spiritual principles. So it's a dot, dot, not a thing. I mean, it's a whole different thing we didn't even talk about. The spiritual aspect of the disease, you know, you become mm -hmm. morally bankrupt. 
spiritually bankrupt. So one guy who used to pray a lot, all of a sudden he don't want to talk about God. But let's not go back to that. The idea is there is a solution for everyone. And the solution is that you need to take the, or the person needs to take the special care or the special um, um, actions that are required for them to get better. So whatever it takes. I mean, at the ending of the day, if you if you want to stay alive, because it is a matter of life mm-hmm. and death. Uh, we, you know, we're in. You you hear the stories, right? Like you know, well, this guy, you know, he stopped drinking, then he went back out, and now he's dead. And and you know, so um, it is very important that you seek whatever whatever solution there is. You know, some people might have hang-ups about going to church and hang-ups about this and how. Listen, at the ending of the day, if, if somebody gets the help they need and they come out of the detox and they come out of the program, um, this is where the family becomes more important than anything else because now mm-hmm. they, they need that support, they need yes. that help, you know, along with the doctors and the therapists. Mm-hmm. That's right, that's right. And let's go to close up with another song by our dear Angela Moti. You're listening to the Ken Romper song. <laughs> मुझको भी है पता हो रहा है जुदा That's our girl Angela Moti and Rashid Bakas, a great guy. दूर जागे भी मुझसे Come 
ना नहीं to the Ken Rampersad show ladies and gentlemen it's that time when we have to pull the curtains down before we do that I would like to say um, and I always like to appreciate all those who have helped me throughout this journey thank you so much to the beautiful Shanaz Hussein for taking my hand and to bring me this far I will always love you no matter what happened you are the wind beneath my wing bringing doing all of this to all my viewers you would not even know I'm so thankful and grateful to all of you for uh, supporting me in this and all of you that logged on I appreciate it and I hope that you guys would continue to share this program so other people could hear it um, you know what and if you guys want to hear a song anytime during the week like I said before when I was planning all of this this show is not about me alone um, I am just the host like I was telling my two guests you know this show is for every one of us and if there's a special song that you guys would like to hear anytime you can always inbox me the song name and I have no problem to play your song. And the only thing is that, you know, I can't play but so much song um, when the day comes because I just have two hours um, to play a song. To my two guests, I would like to say thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I know you guys have a wealth of knowledge in this area. And I'm so glad that you were able to come today. And John, to come, I only tell you this yesterday, to come and to share your knowledge with us. Mm -hmm. And you agreed. And to, to Sadi, thank you so much. I know you always have my back. And thanks for your support. Is there anything else you want to say to our guest? No, no. I mean, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, the last time I was here was also a pretty good show. And um, everyone that was um, viewing or listening, um, take care. If you have a family member, um, try to um, get them help. It's a serious disease. Um, it affects people without them even realizing it. And um, I, I know I had a couple of cousins watching. Thank you, guys. I'm not going to shout you out because you I don't do want that. you... No, you I don't want him to get embarrassed and be like, why you call my name on, on TV? Uh, but, you know, thank you, guys. Um, thank you for your support. And um, thank, thank you for asking me. And thank you, John, for, for helping me along here. Thanks. I see Sirani Lee. Um, Sirani watching from England. Very good to have you on, Miss Nurse. Go ahead, John. What do you want to say? I just want to say one thing. It was a wonderful experience being here. Um, maybe I'll get a shot at coming back again as long as he's coming. <laughs> Um, it's been a, a true, a true experience, and and uh, thank you for inviting me here. And I want to say to those people that are out there, don't drink and drive, and don't drive to drink. Mm. <laughs> That's right, don't drink and drive. And you know the holiday is coming up, guys, mm. and we don't want you to drink and drive. You know what? This, uh, especially if in the United States, especially Guyana too. If uh, you guys want to drink, go and take a little drink. And like like Shabir um, was saying, you know what? You can do anything you want, but do it, um, 
be what well, considerate in your drinking or whatever it is. Remember those little children that's running across the road in Guyana, and those pe so much people can lose their lives, and we are hearing all the sad news. But drinking and driving, please be considerate for your fellow human beings. Be people. responsible. That's that's right. There is so much taxi service all over the place. Mm -hmm. Until next week, ladies and gentlemen, do have yourself a very pleasant evening and a good week. Until next time, don't forget to get me catch me in Shanaz on Chit Chat with Shanaz and Ken tomorrow night right here on the Island Zone Radio. A very pleasant good night to all of you. Good night. Good night.